Hey guys, EST here with a quick video to talk about the basic steps that you can do to lessen the blow of any kind of uh, supply chain disruptions and product shortages that we might have in the near future. And I did already do one take of this video where I talked about like what causes it and all, you know, this policy, that policy, and this anecdote from history and, oh, let's do a quick case study on like Syria and, the, you know, what happened there and how the UN food supply drops were seized by criminal gangs and all this, but it's like... We don't really care about the why. That's not really the context of this video. I want to skip that and just tell people, okay, supply disruptions might happen. What kind of products could it affect and, and what can you do about it right now? And I do want to just kind of skip over the really obvious stuff. If you need medication daily, like you got severe allergies like me, buy up like a year worth of meds. I mean, that's almost a given, but I guess I'll mention it. I don't want to like bury the lead and skip over the really obvious stuff, but I'm not going to focus on it. And the other thing I do want to mention is uh, it, this is not like, oh, the Black Plague happened and the farmers are literally dead. Like the population got cut in half. Good luck maintaining a supply chain and an economy with that. When there's like literally no people to work the jobs or like there's a war and everybody got drafted and went over there and now they're dead. That's a supply chain disruption that it's like, that's not getting better. Now the ones in you know 2021 have been government mandated. So, I mean, it could only get so bad before we've seen people just ignore it. Just localities be like, we're not going to enforce this. We're going into work. Screw you. You know, it's a lot of the blue states because they're, you know, nanny states, babysit the populace. They're too stupid to manage themselves. You know, they're, they're ruling philosophy at this point, if you study history at all. So at a certain point, people are going to be like, I, I, what are you going to do? Shoot me? I'm going into work. You know, and certain cities are just like, fine, enough people are not you know, complying with it that the police literally can enforce it. So remember, it can only get so bad before people are just like, well, no. And we're seeing protests in France and all that. So, I mean, like I said, I'm not going to get into politics, but you look at like, oh, there's a world war. All of the metal went to go build planes. Like that's a shortage. Like you're, you're, there's no getting around that. We need that. Like the people are literally not here working the jobs. They're over there fighting. Or, you know, the Black Plague, people are dead, they don't exist, there are no farmers because they died. There is almost no limit at that point where, like, war broke out or a really high death rate, you know, thing broke out or, like, a weather event like Hurricane Katrina. Nobody was open after Hurricane Katrina. So you get to a certain point where it's like, now that's a supply chain disruption. But even during Hurricane Katrina, I think the Army Corps of Engineers got that, uh... Uh, you know, the damaged um, uh, um, gasoline distillation places up and running to get the gas supply flowing because that affects the entire rest of the country. They got that crap up and running, what, like nine days or something? I don't even remember there being a fuel shortage during Hurricane Katrina. Most of the refineries are down there in the south, actually, as far as I know. So it's like, yeah, in America, we do have, like, the cushy backup plan, the infrastructure, the money, the technology, the vehicles to, like, handle even big scale stuff to an extent. And I don't think we're on the verge of, like, a Syria-level war. And I have heard some really bad stuff come out of Syria where, like, people broke into each other's houses and, like, their own family, their neighbors, like, killed them and took all their food. It's, it's getting wild over there. I mean, the supply drops coming from the UN and all that and the Red Cross and whoever else is over there. And other uh, criminal gangs just take it, sell it back to you. And, uh, I mean, just there's no cops. It's, it's a complete and utter collapse. It's a war zone. Are we going to see that in America? Probably not. It's not impossible, but probably not, especially not from this. So I just wanted to set the scale real quick about how bad can it really get? And I think the, the worst we're going to see is you walk into a grocery store and 10% of the products are off the shelf because of another disruption from laws, lockdowns, people willingly staying home, just whatever, just a, a general disruption. But remember, it can only get so bad because I, I hate to say it's like self-imposed. I mean, COVID is real. A lot of people died. A lot of people are susceptible. A lot of people are old, fat, and diabetic. Okay. But like I said, at a certain point, people just say, no, blow off the government, give the middle finger and go to work, you know? So are we going to see the point where somebody walks into a grocery store and it's 80% empty? They freak out. They raid the place. Everybody just snaps and resorts to you know, looting, and then all of a sudden there is no grocery store because everybody broke all the doors and windows and stuff. And then the, the resupply shipments from the semis are like, well, we aren't going here. The place is destroyed and they can't operate. And then, well, then what does the urban center do? Because obviously that would be an urban center where that happens. I don't think it's going to get that bad. I think it's just going to get tight. So with that, like what to expect in the next year or two, potentially, what should you do about that scale of event? And in this video, I'm mostly going to talk about food because you need it. And then obviously I'm not going to cover the real prepper basics. Like, yes, no matter what's going to happen, prepare for the worst and hope for the best and all this stuff. 
Um, and if you're prepared for, like they say, a zombie apocalypse, you'll be prepared for something that will actually happen. May actually happen, I should say. So have the ability to get water and filter it, drink it, cook with it. Have a way to cook other than electricity. Have a way to charge your cell phone without, you know, with, with just solar. Cover the basics. You know, have self-defense items, whatever you can legally have, a gun, a pepper spray, taser, baseball bat, a moderately heavy coconut, whatever's legal in your area. Maybe learn how to garden, maybe learn how to hunt, maybe learn how to gut a fish, you know, just the basic, you know, know how to take care of yourself in case the worst happens. And in, if something lesser happens, then you'll be, I hate to use the term overprepared, but sufficiently prepared, I think would be that. So cover your bases. And then I'm not even going to cover the obvious stuff like, oh, if you have severe allergies and you need allergy medication, then maybe you should go buy a year worth of it. Yeah, do that. Duh. But the big thing with, with how bad this could get is the psychological aspect. And I, I've seen very, very weak, pathetic, fragile people online complaining about, oh no, I couldn't get my Starbucks. I'm so depressed. You know, you got that all the way up to like, you know, somebody who lives out in the cabin in the woods and they're self-sufficient and they don't care. Like, or they're at least trained for it and who cares where they live now? They're all set. And they've been through shortages. They've, they've been through wars. They've been through whatever. I mean, we're talking people where not a lot of Great Depression people are still alive these days. And I wouldn't consider them self-sufficient just purely due to their age and physical abilities at this time. But just think about those people where they like they made it work. They fixed their own shoes. They traded services with each other at the local level. They made deals directly with farmers instead of going up the supply chain and the back down into a store. They learned to garden. They grew their own food. They, you know, sewed their own clothes. They bartered. They worked two jobs. They sent their kids to work, you know, debatably whether or not that was <laughs> good. Like 1910 to 1920 was not a great example of capitalism working in its purest form. But um, if you got to stay alive, you got to stay alive. Okay, your kids ain't going to be playing video games if, if you're starving. You know what I mean? So, I mean, you, you just go to like modern day Cuba. It's like you got all these restrictions. You got a very limited supply. You got a terrible crooked government that seizes everything, gives it to the rich people in power. What else is new? And then you, everybody walks in the store after a one hour line and there's nothing but garbanzo beans on the shelves things are tough you can never get what you need and imports are not coming in they don't have a good economy so they can't trade effectively at a good ratio with like europe and america and because of restrictions because the government's awful but they're too stubborn to just like you know go slightly democratic like china did and at least um have something that resembles an open market. So they did it to themselves. So, okay, that's the cause. The effect is, well, all the cars are from the 50s because that's the last thing they could import and everybody learned to fix their own darn cars. You know, it's like, if you got to get places, you, you do it. If you got to eat something, you learn to cook something different. You learn to just deal with not having all the food you want at the snap of a finger. You know, we got it pretty good in America right now. So you got to get in the mindset of, okay, I'll just cook something different. I'll do something different. I'm not going to let it just one thing after another chip away at my happiness. And then I'm just find myself in a deep, deep depression because, you know, this went wrong and that went wrong and this is happening and all my family's complaining about this and I can't travel to see this. It's like, it's just one tiny thing after another to the point where people just just hit their breaking point. I mean, the number of like mental illness cases and even just like suicides in 2020 and 2021 has skyrocketed because even this slight little, oh, you can't leave your house for a bit. Oh, a job disruption. Oh, I'm concerned. I'm worried. Oh, little food disruption, little you know thing here. Oh, my favorite two businesses went out of business permanently or oh, and then a family member died because it caught COVID and they were old or fat or whatever. The things pile on and the number one threat to people in the last two years was either depending upon your susceptibility, the disease itself, or the mental part of it. It's the worry, the stress, the feel like there's no way out. I mean, the, p humans don't do well with that unless you're prepared for it. So the number one way I wanted to focus on first about how to handle especially a food shortage or just a general product shortage is to be mentally prepared for it. Just set your, your sights so low and just be like, I might have to work around my normal diet. I might have to learn to cook. I might be priced out of even fast food. Hell, I practically have been in the last couple months. I'm trying to lose weight and I do a lot of gardening, so I'm already moving in that direction myself. Obviously, hello, I run a prepper channel. But I mean, if you if you can't just, you're having a bad day and you want to fill, you know, eat your feelings, you know, to do that once in a while, okay, to do it every day, that's how you get morbidly obese. But there's nothing wrong with like, you know, oh, when I was a kid and I had a bad day or I had a big accomplishment or something we celebrated with, you know, or, or it was a holiday we celebrated with ice cream, but now I can't go out and get ice cream and now it's like, I feel trapped, you know, it's just, it's the one thing after another, after another, after another, after another, chipping away at your happiness that's going to really sink you quick. So just mentally prepare for like, like have the attitude that they had in the Great Depression or in Cuba, 
where it's like, okay, things are bad, but I'm going to make the most out of it. Like, I'm, I'm going to shift my priori priorities to, oh, I can't afford this video game and I really wanted to play it. Well, at least you can, like, hang out with your family. At least you have a family. At least then, okay, grill out with the neighbors and enjoy each other's company. You, know, you can do things that are enjoyable. You just have to shift it. You, you got to get out of that selfish attitude of I'm always going to get what I want because it's always on the shelf. It's always down the street. I can just click, click, click and get it off of Amazon or eBay. You get so used to that that you take it for granted to the point where when it, some of it goes away, you just like lose your mind. If, like you said, you're pretty much a fragile person. No offense to you, but you need to get off that. You got to just have that. I'm going to move forward. I don't care what's in my way. I'm going to confidently march forward and do what I have to do to keep living and to have some semblance of a life and happiness. You have to adopt that mindset. So now that I hit on the number one thing that is the most important above all else, we're going to get to the practical little steps. Number one, I think I already mentioned this, but learn to cook. Like, and learn to cook in general. Don't just, you know, I learned five recipes and I have no idea how they work or the chemistry works behind them. Know how bread works. Know how, like, know 10 different recipes to build different types of bread. And then you'll just, at a fundamental level, understand how bread works. And you'll look and say, oh, well, I have this, this, and this. I can make this type of bread. I can make, you know, unleavened but poofy bread by just substituting in, you know, baking soda. And then I don't need yeast, you know? That would be a rhubarb bread or like a sugary bread, you know, like a, a dessert bread, a cake style thing with like a quick rise CO2 release. Or to say, oh, I can't make bread, but I can make pancakes. Okay, well, let's do that. Or, oh, um, I, I just learned to make all the common breakfast foods because they're the easiest. You know, I know how to cook an egg. I've just done it three times. And whether or not you're interested in cooking, you did it enough to get used to it so that if you have to go back to that, because a dozen eggs is still about a dollar to a dollar fifty in my area. Scrambled eggs, some little cheap potatoes. They're still selling potatoes for like 37 cents a pound or something at my gas station, let alone the grocery store. I learned to make a baked potato. I learned how to make um, boiled potatoes and I learned how to make um, homemade hash browns. I got good at it. Now I can eat for cheap. And honestly, it's like restaurant quality. Don't think, oh, because somebody, you know, went and got a two-year chef degree, culinary arts degree, I should say, that they're like so far ahead of you that it's to the point where like you would try to land an airplane or do surgery or something. Like you can learn to cook about as good as a cook. They're always going to be a little better than you, but you can get to a proficiency level where you're like, I just made a fresh edible meal that's on par with like a medium quality restaurant. A lot of this stuff, it's it's down to like a brainless science. I mean, some stuff is incredibly difficult to prepare, but some of it isn't. So if you learn the really basic like three ingredient staples and or like one ingredient staples, like a baked potato or like scrambled eggs, I mean, you might put some cheese on it or whatever, but uh, I don't consider salt and pepper to be ingredients, but I mean, I even just grew some onions. You just throw the seeds in the ground, water it occasionally, and onions are the easiest damn thing in the world to grow. And then I pull them out, chop them up, put them on my omelet, and there you go. I mean, I just cook something that's tasty and it's fresh. And it's, it's so much better than eating all this processed crap or pre-prepared stuff for fast food stuff or spending, you know, 20 bucks a plate on like really good stuff at a really good restaurant because that might go away for one reason or another, economic or closures. And I will say, I mean, food does make me happy. Like I said, don't eat your feelings every day because you hate your life and that's how you cope. That's going to be a bad spiral into obesity. But if once in a while you had a bad day and you want to cook a real fresh good meal you know, with fresh butter and everything and make a full like English breakfast and then eat it, you're going to feel better. Good food makes you feel good. It, it's just, it's a dopamine thing. It's, it's a chemical thing. So if you do that once in a while, you can sit back and think, well, at least I have this. At least I'm happy because my stomach's full and that was incredibly tasty. And you did it yourself and you did it for cheaper than getting food from other sources or from making the same five recipes that you bothered to learn 10 years ago. And you're like, oh, there's this again. Eh whatever okay so learn to cook and learn to cook not just recipes but in general learn to adapt your own recipes just know what works and know what substitutions you can do and have it still be a valid meal because then you can walk into the store and be like oh wow they're out of this this and this but i can still make this this and this i can still make a pasta salad you, you throw pasta and mayonnaise into a thing you can make anything out of that and you throw peas ham and i don't know onions vidalias there you go you got like one type of pasta salad or you can make another you can make a an italian style a mediterranean style one because they had olives I mean, these are, they're very varied and pasta is like, what, a dollar a box for like 12 ounces of it or something? I mean, come on. So find the cheapest ingredients, learn what you can do with them and just have a basic knowledge of how to take care of yourself and make your own meals for dirt cheap in case ingredients start to go out or prepared food or businesses that serve it start to go out. 
Because then no matter how stressful things get at work or how now you have to work other hours to cover for other people because they're out or they're getting paid to stay home and not work by the government. So, of course, they're not coming back in and now you got to work double. Or, you know, now you're worried about your parents' business, your uncle's business because you heard they're not doing very well and they've had it for 30 years and you don't want them to close. So now you're stressed about that and there's nothing you can do about that. At least you can come home and be like, well, at least my food security is good and my bank account is doing well because I have food security. I have the knowledge to, to know how to adapt to that. Now, the other big thing is malnutrition. And believe it or not, malnutrition in the last 30 years is on the rise in America. You're probably thinking, what? But there's so much like junk food, you know, empty calorie crap, and it's usually the cheapest food you can buy. So they say in these studies I've, I've seen that the low income areas are the ones with the highest amount of modern day first world malnutrition because they're, you know, they're eating Doritos. That's just like empty calorie starch and oil. There's, there's no vitamins in that. There's no, you know, anything. So yeah, you could probably just take a multivitamin and then eat whatever you want. And it just comes down to chemical energy, but not quite. It's a little bit past that. So at one, do pick up a multivitamin and it, we've learned that it was a borderline scam to tell you you need it every single day. It's not bad for you. It's just not necessary. I've heard the numbers of closer to every three days to every seven days you take a multivitamin and you've got all the selenium and you know whatever you need besides like vitamin c and vitamin b and the basic stuff so do pick that up do get on that or do if you don't believe in or don't think you need it or you're already really watching your diet at least have it i mean you can get a, a one year supply of like knockoff centrum for like nine dollars at costco i think i bought a 600 pill one time and it was like oh boy probably 14 dollars yeah, have that. I mean, d definitely have that. And in fact, put it in Mylar with an oxygen absorber and seal it up with heat. I mean, I have a video about that. The shelf life on that will be a little bit past. It's still not the safest thing in the world, but in case of an emergency, you do not want to get into malnutrition because it can cause not clear thoughts. It can actually chemically cause depression and you don't know what's wrong with you. You're like, I feel like I'm mentally prepared for this and I should be happy, but I'm not. I just feel lethargic and tired and all I want to do is sleep. And you're like, what is wrong with me? At that point, it actually is a chemical issue. Usually it's a vitamin B shortage. And the other thing is, I mean, hello, pandemic, you need vitamin D, zinc, and vitamin C. That, that for sure has been established, well, that in eight hours of sleep a night. You, you hit those four, your immune system's at least going to be at the baseline functionality. You start missing those kinds of stuff, getting six hours of sleep, you know, being irresponsible or <laughs> having kids. And then your diet's bad. On top of that, your body's not going to function correctly. And then you might not be able to fight off some kind of illness. So even if we were in like the middle of a war and there was no pandemic, uh, if you catch the flu and instead of getting better in three days you get better in two weeks boy you're not going to feel good for those weeks and then you can't work well what if you're out of sick days when you're not making money and like it just spirals the economic issues one into another into another you can't go out shopping but then also there's a shortage and then also there's not enough doordash workers you can't even order stuff and the, things spiral out of control quickly even in like a modern civilized society it's kind of the same concept as well i'm out in the woods and okay i got this going and maybe i can build a fire maybe i can get a shelter oh but then i broke my leg Oh, you thought you were playing it on hard mode before. No, the game was set to normal. Now you're playing it on hard mode. So the last thing you want is your health failing in the middle of an already bad scenario or you just being tired or just in a bad mood and you don't know why. So definitely learn about the basics of nutrition. Now, I went to an exceptionally good high school. Whenever I hear people saying, why do people in America not learn like practical stuff, like how to calculate a mortgage and you know balance your checkbook and you know pay taxes? We did learn all that. What the hell school did you all go to? I went to a public school. It just happens to be one of the absolute best in, in my state. But we, we had a cooking class in, in biology and um, health class and chemistry. All three, we learned like what amino acids are and why you need them and like the nine that your body can't produce and the 11 that you could use but don't need and what kind of foods contain them and we did a study and we we tracked our eating for a week and then analyzed it and tried to fix it like we did all this in public school and i still remember the main points of it because my brain marked it as hey you should remember this this is actually important i don't give a crap how igneous rocks form or what temperature they are or how many miles down they are in the crust i don't use that in my daily life but when somebody said oh vitamin c helps cell division so you need more vitamin c if you're injured i i stored that in the important file in my brain so if you didn't have good schooling, or honestly, if you're like 15, when you went to school, they didn't know what the hell they were talking about and probably said that there's no subatomic particles smaller than a proton, or they said the food pyramid is like a thing that you should actually go by, which it's pretty much absolute BS, might want to refresh, update, or you know, get an initial starting on, on the information of just how dietary stuff works, like what the main vitamins do, how to diagnose what's, what's wrong with you if you're not feeling right. How to identify like rickets, scurvy, like all, all the really, really severe malnutrition. We also learned about that in biology and health class. 
But I mean, you can watch like 10 hours worth of YouTube videos and be like, good, like you're halfway to being a nutritionist practically, it'll feel like. You're not, but it'll feel like that. And then you'll think, oh, okay, so you know, red meats have this and have iron, but then these don't. But then if I eat like a squirrel or a bunny, that's gonna be all protein, but no fats and oil. But you do need fats, you can't live on just protein, but you can break it down for energy. But if you did physical activity, it'll be prioritized to your muscles first. So then you need to eat more calories on top of it. And like all this just stuff, like basic, basic stuff, you need to learn it just to learn how to take care of yourself. And th this is like, you could use it in your daily life, even if everything was normal, obviously, because like I said, malnutrition is on the rise because people are just like, I don't know, I ate this and it tasted good. I went out for fast food and I, don't, I didn't know that it was, you know, half soy and not actual protein. I didn't know that they like spray paint the freaking tomatoes and they picked them so early that there's nothing of nutritional value in there. I thought there's a whole salad on top of my Whopper and I'm good. I'm getting vitamins out of the onions and stuff. The onions actually are pretty good. I think they have a lot of magnesium. It's hard to ruin onions. It's all about shelf life, people. It's all about shelf life. And that's the other thing. People will be like, I'm getting plenty of vitamins and minerals from my canned vegetables. No, you're not. Look at the label. When they pick them and how they process them, there ain't anything of use left in that can. You might as well be eating cotton candy. It, it's empty calories. I guess you get some fiber out of it, maybe. But yeah, I mean, how bad your diet is, is probably not even known to most of you until you start looking into the stuff. So I cannot stress enough. Number two is learn about dietary stuff so that you got yourself covered. And it kind of goes with the cooking and then learn what to cook to cover, you know, the, the different food groups and what you need and that kind of stuff. Like somebody could just show me a handful of berries and I'll be like, oh yeah, vitamin B. You got to get to that level and it's not hard to get to that level of information and knowledge. It, it's pretty basic stuff and the, the resources are out there everywhere. Now, one thing I didn't mention, but it, I thought it goes a little saying, but I guess I'll, I'll mention it. Um, learn how to cook in multiple ways. Like if there's no electricity or the, you know, there's no propane for your propane stove, know how to cook on a campfire, know how to grill. So like try, try all the different major methods of cooking and then learn how to do stuff that doesn't require heat. Because if you're like, I know how to cook, but then everything you've ever done involves an oven and a stovetop. Oh boy. Things go a lot differently on a grill. I did not know how differently. I'm kind of just learning how to grill like this month, believe it or not, embarrassingly enough. I just kind of took it for granted because my parents always grilled out on top of campfires on a grill when I was growing up and it looked easy. Um, it, it's, it's just a little, it's different. It's not harder. It's just different. So if you want to get to like really severe stuff, like, like more than we're going to probably see in 2022, which is just, oh, a little bit of disruption here and there, where if you're over the mental part of it, you can adapt around shortages and you can just mentally prepare for, okay, things are bad, but they'll get better. I'm going to live my life. I'm not going to dwell on it and I'm not going to let it drag me down. So in other words, everything I said in the video, if you want to go past that, learn how to garden, learn how to grow your food, learn how to forage and stuff, in, you know, if in case of an absolute emergency, learn how to gut a squirrel or a trout or whatever. Learn how to you know, cook vegetables. Learn how to know when a watermelon is ripe. I mean, get into gardening. The one thing is like learn how to deal with pests and, and uh, mold and fungi because they will... Okay, that's the same thing. But anyway, they will wreck your entire food supply. I mean, they, remember like the, the potato blight that killed like millions of people or whatever or thousands however much it was in Ireland? They didn't have a way around it. They didn't have neem oil. They didn't have like bomide products. They didn't know that simple baking soda or powder, oh my God, I feel like I should know this, uh, spread on the leaves could, could you know, cure the plant. But if you do garden, you do see what goes wrong, especially in your area, because like people keep talking about, oh, this beetle and that, you know, corn boring, whatever, th those aren't in Wisconsin, it turns out. So I've been watching gardening channels, I'm like, oh, oh write this down, oh, know how to identify it, know how to do it, and then it turns out, it's not even a problem in my area. And then they're all talking about, oh yeah, you gotta keep the crows off this and do this and this, this type of worm and that beetle, and then it turns out ants ate a whole bunch of my, um, corn because it has sugar in it i didn't know corn could be attacked by ants so then i had to learn how to organically properly kill ants without you know g just going to the store because maybe the store is not open not there doesn't have the products there's a shortage they didn't come in from china whatever's you know disruptions like i said uh turns out you can take borax uh, which is like laundry detergent which you should you know have a little mason jar full of that just in case uh mix it with water and and then put sugar in it ants will eat it and they'll, they'll die there you go if you're buying professional ant killer at the store, you're buying borax and sugar solution. You're overpaying, actually. So, like, I know that. And if I didn't know that, literally half my corn would have been eaten, if not all of it. it my whole entire crop would have been destroyed. And the other thing is learn what to grow. I mean, I grow beans because they're easy. Beans do not have the highest of calories. Like, pintos do, but it depends when you cook them and, you know, whatever. But, like, tomatoes, I mean, they got a bit of sugar. Um, carrots, you wouldn't think they got a lot of energy. They actually do. Uh, potatoes, that that's your king right there. That's starch. That's, that's huge calories. But then they drain a lot of nitrogen from the soil. So then you have to know how to make your own nitrogen fertilizer from composting. 
Basically, if it's green and it's a weed or a grass, cut it down, throw it in the compost pile, compress it, make sure it's wet, flip it every week, and there you go. You got nitrogen fertilizer to mix into your soil. See, I know this because I did it for a year. I could stop gardening right now and I'd still have sufficient knowledge. So if, like, if you're not into gardening, just drag yourself through doing it for a year or two. Just be like, okay, I think I'm, I'm at the point where I stopped making enough mistakes that I could get a, an okay food supply if I absolutely had to. And then sell everything you grew on, on Facebook Marketplace or at a flea market uh, or a market, uh, what do you call that, a farmer's market? Pocket $500 and then don't garden again or realize it's, it's actually really big money and then do it you know double the next year. But um, if you have in the back of your mind, if things got really, really bad, I could eat like one meal a day for two months on my garden in the late um, uh, summer into fall, which is how I describe myself. And my total gardening area is like 40 square feet. I have a very tiny lot. It's it's very suburban. It's practically in a city. So you apartment dwellers, I mean, you're limited on your options. You can usually get like little, you know, the trays that can grow on your balcony or whatever. But I mean, okay. You might be able to just say, hey, can we go cut open, you know, 40 square feet of the lawn and just have like a community garden and anybody wants to participate or grab free food from it does it. And the person will be like, if you do it all or just be like, hey, you know, it'll be a value added benefit for my apartment building. Give me a hundred bucks for soil and fertilizer and I'll, I'll, I'll handle it from there. And they'll be like, all right, sure. Most of them are cool with that because, I mean, like free fresh food. You want to talk about people, you know, willing to pay 20 bucks extra on their rent or not wanting to move. Hell yeah, you go out, walk home every day and get a fresh uh, fresh tomato or potato for free. I mean, there are like big tech campuses in Silicon Valley that don't give out food for free. If they do, people will like single-handedly want to work there because free food. You know, it's, it's like the dumbest thing. They're making 200 grand a year, but they don't want to leave for a better job because of the free food. It is a smart worker retention strategy. But yeah, I mean, if there's a patch of anything that resembles, you know, something that, that's green or has soil, you could probably get something going, okay? Heck, go to your local park, your department of parks, if you live in the worst of the worst cities with the, like, the highest density of not living things and nothing green and just be like, can I set up something in the park? Can I do this? Can I do that? I mean, somebody will probably vandalize it because cities are awful. You should probably just move. But I mean, you know, your church's parking lot, your back lot, put it in a secured fence. You know, find a, a private school, like a Catholic school. They usually have everything fenced in because they got money. Go set up and maintain a garden there and get good at it. And then they can say, hey, we don't have a, a food bank, but we do have, you know, fresh food. Go get some gardening food. All you, you know, poor people who are, you know, coming around asking for assistance. There is ways around everything. Don't give up just because, oh, uh, well, I, I'm, I don't live in a house. So, I, uh, oh, well, I'm not going to learn how to be self-sufficient in garden. For realism, you could cut it out because where are you going to go to grow it in case of an emergency? But, like, I, I just say, you know... Right now, my medical treatment skills, in case somebody got shot, are unbelievably basic. So I just thought, well, I'll stay out of it. It's not my problem. Well, what if I get shot? So I really, like, I should learn it just to learn it, even though I don't want to. I don't have a big interest in that, but I know I should know it. So it's one of those things where I got to force myself to eventually learn it. And I would say that that's the same for, like, water filtration, safety, like bushcrafting, woodsman stuff, building a shelter. You might think, I don't want to build a shelter in the woods in case of a severe emergency where my entire town, city, house burned down and I'm out in the woods alone. But in case that happens, you know, like, okay, I took a weekend and learned it, whatever. Now it's in my mind. It's my knowledge, whatever. It's like learning a second language. I never want to do it. Nobody ever wants to do it, but I did drag myself through it because I know that it would be beneficial and I know that I kind of need it for certain things. So sometimes you just got to man up, be an adult and be like, I don't want to do this, but I'm going to do it. I mean, you know how like, like the parents who never make their kids clean up after themselves and then they go off to college and the dorm is like a, a FEMA super fun site, like biohazard. <laughs> yeah, that's what happens if you never learn to be like, like, I have to do this because I have to do this. So, you know, man up, be an adult, and learn this stuff, even if you don't want to. Or if you do want to, then just take the time and effort and stop kicking it down the road and procrastinating. Because, uh, newsflash, the shortages and the food shortages and stuff are here now. I mean, my area was out of certain types of milk. They were out of, um... There's a lot of apologetic signs on a lot of shelves on a lot of different stores of different types right now in my area. And allegedly it's only going to get worse. It could get better, but it's just... If you took the time to come watch this video to learn the basics and, and the, the high level most important priority stuff about how to mentally and practically handle product shortages, you're obviously into it enough to put in the effort and take time out of your day to like start doing things. So just take the extra effort and say, what am I going to do tomorrow? And the big overwhelming thing, just to, to close out this video, the number one thing that just destroys new people who are getting into preparedness and, you know, disaster preparedness and like self-sufficiency, homesteading, bushcraft, whatever what you want to focus on or call it, 
is they, they, they start getting into it just a little bit. They start learning about what they need to learn. And they're like, holy crap, this is too much. And then they just give it up. They think, I got to learn water filtration, safety, biology, bushcraft, this, how to do this. I got to learn hunting. I got to learn gardening. I got to learn medical care. I've got to learn you know, emergency, like electricity wiring and solar. And uh, that's, it's all too much. I'm not going to do it. Let me just borrow something from Alcoholics Anonymous or from the, the people who do like nicotine, you know, quitting smoking support groups. Don't wake up in the morning and think, okay, from now until the rest of my life forever, I can never have another cigarette again, because that's going to overwhelm you and it's going to make you give up. The thought of, of this is going to be this way forever, it's never going to get better, and just look at the amount of workload ahead of me, I don't want to do that. People getting overwhelmed is why they stop anything, really, any project, any, any self-improvement, anything. So what you do is you say, I'm not going to worry about the future. I'm, I'm going to, you know, say maybe I'll fail. Maybe I will, you know, take a weekend to myself, go on vacation, learn absolutely nothing, neglect gardening, neglect the YouTube videos that are in my queue on watch later. I'm not going to learn this right now. And okay, I've, I've failed for the weekend, but like, you got to give yourself leeway. Okay. You can't just be like, no, this is my life from now on. Mm, super strict military. Let's go. You got to say, maybe I'll, maybe I'll smoke a cigarette tomorrow. Maybe sometime this month I'll, I'll fail a couple times, but Today, I'm not going to. Right now, this lunch hour, I'm not going to have a cigarette. I, today, I'm going to not get drunk. This weekend, Friday, I'm not going out to the bars. Now, I don't claim to fully understand this. I know you're probably going to think, oh, wow, he's speaking from personal. No, I've never smoked anything in my life, and I've never had an alcoholic beverage. I just never got into those things because I've seen the problems it caused for other people, and I'm not stupid. Also, I had at least pretty good parenting in that regard. I wouldn't say in general, but um, if you see my other channel, you know I've hinted at the fact that I'm, I'm very, very sugarcoating that. But uh, hey, I turned out to be a well-adjusted, uh, successful person, so hey, somewhat. I mean, also, also, once again, you may have seen my other channel, but anyway, just say, okay, I'm going to learn this today. I'm going to acquire this skill today. I'm going to go out and practice with firearms today. I'm going to go take a firearm safety class today. So I've moved 1% in the direction I need to go. You know, it's like if you just decided, fine, I'm going to clean my whole house. You don't think, oh, it's overwhelming. Oh, I did one thing. Look, look at how much work it is. Ah, screw the whole thing. You just, you take one day, one minute, one thing between, you know, Netflix episodes or whatever. Although seriously, cancel Netflix. They're awful. And you say, I'm going to clean the floors. There you go. took five, 10 minutes, clean, vacuum. The floors are clean. There, you did a thing. You can sit back and think, I just did a thing. I just progressed in the direction I need to go. And then you get up and do another thing and you feel good about that. You, you don't focus on the, the whole. You focus on what can I do right now? What's one step in the direction I can go? And even they say this for like emergency, like hiking, like, oh my God, I'm three miles off the path. I have to, you know, walk three miles and I'm already tired. You just say, D don't get overwhelmed and like give up with the whole, oh my God, I'm never going to make it. Look how far this is. You think, I'm going to put one foot in front of another right now. I'm going to take, you know, I'm going to walk to that tree. We're not going to worry about the whole trip. I'm going to go as far as I can go right now and then see if I can go further. I'm, I'm just going to focus on the short term, not look at this overwhelming thing that I have to tackle. So don't get into prepping and think, oh my God, look at all this stuff I don't know and all this stuff I don't own and all these tools and equipment and look at all the money and the time and the skills and the training. Oh, it's all so overwhelming. Okay, I give up. Fine. I'll just die. If there's another Hurricane Katrina, oh well, I'll just be one of the victims because this is too hard. Don't look at the hole. Just go take a class on a weekend. Go learn a thing. Acquire a skill. You can ease into it. And the other thing is people are like, oh, I'm not safe right now. I need to rush into all of this. It is true, but over the last 10 years, how many emergency situations broke out in your country, your area, or you personally? Like how many times were you stabbed? How many times were you in a car accident and needed to know medical stuff? How many times were you lost out in the woods? How many times did World War III break out? <laughs> the answer is zero. Uh, the human psychology also doesn't handle well looming, unknown, vague threats that could come from anywhere. People don't like fear of the unknown, and people don't like fear of things they can't see. That's why almost everybody's afraid of the dark, because there could be anything in the dark. It could be a predator, it could be something that can see in the dark, it could be a wolf. It could be a robber, it could be anything. You might trip over something. It's like, that's why people don't like unknown. They don't like vagueness. They, they like to know what's going on and feel like they're in control. So if you feel like you're out of control, just reel it back in and say, no, this is what I'm going to do about it today. And that, that also, like I said, kind of calls back to the whole, oh no, this is, you know, I had to switch jobs and that was stressful. This store is closing and that was stressful. My family's not doing okay and that's stressful. Uh, I couldn't go out to get the, the food I want that I really wanted and that's stressful. And it all builds up, builds up, builds up. Just reel it back in and be like, I 
I'm okay. This is okay. What am I going to do about it right now this second? And what am I going to do about it tomorrow? Now, don't look into the future. Just be like, we're going to take one step at a time if it's starting to overwhelm you. Me personally, I don't mean to like brag or anything and say I'm, I'm so great, but like just my personality at this point with all the training I've had and all the, just my level of just confidence going into any situation, because I used to have very unbelievably severe crippling anxiety, like the worst you could ever possibly imagine. And I, I put so much effort into getting over it and exposure therapy and just dealing with it that I've kind of swung a little too far to the other way if... if such a thing could be possible where now I don't care what's happening. I'm going to keep a cool head and be like, well, we're moving forward then. Oh, setback. Okay. Then what are we going to do? Let's adapt. Like it just, I don't let things drag me down because what is the constructive purpose of that? You just move past it. It's gotten to the point where I don't even really have nightmares anymore. Anytime I'm like, oh, something's attacking me in the dream. I'll just pull out a gun and shoot it. And then I'm fine. Like, because I know my brain knows that that's what's going to happen. I'm so confident in my abilities to mentally and physically deal with anything that it's just like it, this kind of stuff. I just, I just switch it off and I just move forward. And if you know anybody in the military, which I wasn't in, that's, that's how they train them. They, they don't want you to shut down. They don't want you to, to freak out or to handle things badly. They say, you just switch it off and resort to your training. You just go, this is the situation. I'm not going to panic. Panicking is nothing. Let's go. So if you get into even a fraction of that mindset, you're, you're going to feel mentally tougher. And when, you know, minor to medium things happen, you're going to move through it and look back and be like, wow, I actually handled that pretty well. I didn't shut down. I didn't freak out. I didn't panic. I didn't look like a fool. I didn't handle it poorly. You know, okay. And then that builds on the confidence. You're like, well, now something even bigger, I could probably handle that. So you got to just generally be, be hardy, be resistant, you know, be the person with the sufficient skills, have the confidence and don't let things overwhelm you. The mental aspect I wanted to you know, focus on the most when it comes to product shortages, food shortages, you know, economic stress, daily worry about the future of like your whole country, the whole world, your personal life, whatever's going on, your economics, small, large, medium, anything. The number one thing that's going to drag you down is not practically like, okay, what do I get to eat? Unless it's in the most severe of unbelievably bad scenarios. It's really just you defeating yourself mentally because of the, the stuff you didn't prepare for. So get that mental toughness, get the skills, get the confidence, don't get shut down, know how to switch it off and move forward, and you will be very happy with how you handled all this stuff. And just one more personal anecdote. I mean, I saw through 2020 and 2021 what people were posting on Facebook, my friends who were just like freaking out over all this stuff, you know, and rightfully so. They're like, oh, my, my husband lost his job and this is happening and I have to stay home because I'm susceptible. I can't go to church and that's you know, driving me nuts. This is an adjustment. I can't exercise. The house is a mess. I can't even go out to get the groceries I want. You know, they're just like, they're just like shutting down and losing it. And I was there to help them. Not, I'm just out there like, hey man, huh? you know, I work from home anyway. I have like different job options. I've shifted away from this and towards this because I had economic preparedness as well. I've liquidated some of my stuff. I sold some of my firearms and ammo because it was an opportune time to do so. And uh, spoiler alert, I already had like 144 rolls of toilet paper. Does anybody need some? You know, I'm out there. I literally delivered. I went on like a delivery route delivering spare hand sanitizer that I already had because I bought it up in February. So, okay. Okay. Little late. I'll, I'll say I did have a, a bit one spare 64 because I'm not stupid, but you know, just saying I saw the writing on the walls and I picked up some stuff. I picked up some masks. I picked up, you know, stuff that I need ahead of time because you know, I ain't under a rock. I got my head, you know, on a swivel looking around what's going on so I can react first. Got to have that, that prairie dog or groundhog mentality. You want to stick your head up and look around as, as often as possible. So you can be like, Oh, look at this coming in. I'm, I'm going to get out ahead of this. I'm going to beat the crowd to this before it becomes a problem which uh, very relevant to this video, which is why I wanted to bring it back up. But I mean, I, I was making other people's lives better. I was so set that I was not even worried about me. I was like, well, let's, let's go around and, you know, let's go help people. To be so prepared mentally and equipment wise and economically and intelligence wise and, and like skill wise and wisdom wise on, on like what to do and how to handle stuff and what to already have to the point where I'm like, well, I'm set. <laughs> I have more than enough. Let, let's go help other people who should have been as prepared as me. It's a really good feeling. It's it's a very good thing to do. Not just because helping people is a good thing to do and you should, but like I looked how other people were handling this. And I'm like, wow, wow. You want to talk about a downward spiral, both emotionally, economically, like people had to move. People had to sell their houses. It was getting bad. I mean, I quit one job because I, I am, believe it or not, at a pretty high risk for COVID because of uh, a just psychotic immune system that I have. It goes overboard on everything. And actually I've had allergic reactions to two vaccines in the past. So that's out. 
I was in the hospital after the MMR vaccine with like a 105 fever. I almost died from it. So um, I'm allergic to latex, certain types of silicone. I'm allergic to ibuprofen. Um, I have eczema. I'm on very strong allergy meds. Now, the upside is last time I tested positive for mono, I was sick for about three and a half days. That's a bit unique. So I'm actually pretty sure I already had COVID. I had it for three days. I had a fever. I was throwing up like crazy. I had diary like you wouldn't believe. But it never got to the point where it affected my lungs because it, my immune system just tackled it. Because my immune system attacks everything. I'm allergic to dogs. I'm allergic to wood dust. I'm If you if it's alive, I'm allergic to it. But that means that, that when I caught COVID, I was extremely likely to have complications. And I, I think I caught it when we didn't have widespread testing, so I can't verify it. So I was in the uh-oh category where I had to quit my job because the second they reopened to the public instead of doing car side, that was it. I, I, I literally couldn't do it for my own safety because uh, massive tissue inflammation is what, what really caused complications with otherwise healthy people. And what causes that? An extreme immune reaction. It's your own immune system inflaming all your tissues because it's like, whoa, I'm under attack. Oh my God. And it freaks out and does more damage than the damn virus would. Yep. That describes me. And like I said, I can't, according to multiple doctors, go get the vaccine. Otherwise I would have by now. I mean, I was traveling to Cuba on a mission trip to go do some like volunteer work down there for some churches down there. And that was supposed to happen in March, 2019, Tw no, 2020, one of those. When was the COVID travel restrictions? I feel like I should know this. I don't know. The whole the last two years were a blur. But uh, I went and got a hep booster because I've never had a problem with the hep vaccine. Okay. I'm not anti-vax. I'm not stupid. I'm pro-science and pro-logic, pro-math and pro-statistics. Statistically, it's a pretty damn safe vaccine. Okay, people. But also statistically, I can't get it. Okay. That's not some paranoid delusion. That's doctors. That's facts. You got to be somewhere in the middle on this. You can't go one extreme or the other one. No, nobody should get it. Or, oh, everybody should get it. Just go get it. Just don't even don't even talk to a, a, a doctor. Just go to a 7-Eleven parking lot and go get a vaccine. No, don't do that. Talk to your damn doctor. But for 99% of you, you're going to be fine. I'm just saying, you know, people are saying, oh, there are like chemicals and chips and magnets in it. You're a moron. But would I have been first in line after testing? Hell no, I wouldn't have gotten that vaccine in the first month. Oh, my God. But now we have the numbers to support that almost nobody's having a reaction to it. So it's like... Yeah, come on. But anyway, I mean, that's just my thoughts on that. So I should have been so severely affected. I should have been one of those people where I'm like, you know, because I really don't have money. Like, what do I do? Well, I resumed working for Uber for a little bit. I, I really ramped up my eBay sales that I kind of, you know, let Peter off because I, I knew how to do it. I had an established account. I had the skills. I just kind of left it on the back burner. But at any time I could pick it up and start making an extra thousand a month doing it. You know, just go and picking stuff up at rummage sales, estate sales, Goodwills, you know, thrift shops. It's good money and I can still work my own hours. And I don't know if you noticed, I started another YouTube channel. It's called emergency survival tips it's starting to make money i doubled down on my other uh well i actually made i made three more youtube channels believe it or not and i doubled down on the ones that i already run i actually run five six if you count one that's co-owned by someone else i picked up contractor work and i started another company that i can't really talk about because it'd be really easy to find me but um let's just say it's kind of relevant to 2021 so my business is booming and i'm probably about to start making an absolute metric buttload of money on it so you just you got to have the ability to shift i already knew all the laws the 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 sales tax how that worked i already had an llc it's like I had the ability to shift around, do different jobs. I could go back to working IT once most people were safe. I mean, I had options. I could work for myself because that was a lot safer because I really couldn't safely be around people. You got to be able to pivot and shift and have the skills ahead of time to, to cover yourself. So I didn't just collapse and say, I don't know, I'll just be homeless. I'll move back in with my parents and I'll be on like government support and unemployment and why eh, government come save me. I'm not saying I wouldn't, yeah, I'd be too proud to do that. It's just, I, I'm, I, that's the last possible resort and I can cover my own ass. Thank you very much. You know, and it did work. I've been paying my bills now. So you know, you gotta have the mindset that you're like, I'm not going to let everything bad drag me down. It looks like, like my whole life is over. Everything's ending. My career's over. And just like, oh, I'm going to go complain about it on Facebook and say, what do I do? The mental component and the planning ahead and the strategic, I'm going to change my economics. I'm going to change my work. I'm going to, you know, do this skill. I'm going to adapt around this. I'm going to adapt around the food shortage. I'm going to learn self-defense in case, you know, crime and stuff gets bad in my area. Like if you're prepared for everything that could practically happen in your life within reason, you're going to succeed a lot better just in your career and your life and your own safety generally, which is why you should definitely subscribe to this channel and watch others that are better than me and are better informed and have better specialties. There are better gardening channels out there than this one. There are far better medical emergency channels out there than this one. There are not better food preservation channels out there than this one. I think I got that on lockdown. My number one video right now is the Mylar food preservation thing. And let me just say for 
I think it turned out to be $220. You can have, I think it was six months worth of food. Six months worth of dry goods, like rice, noodles, beans, and sugar, flour, and a couple other things in mylar, in a couple tubs, in your basement, and now you have um, a quarter million calories sitting there for under $300 that you did yourself. You didn't have to go to, like, Patriot Supply and paid ten grand for it. I'm not saying I don't like them and they're not good. I'm just saying, you know, that's rich people stuff. But, like, you want peace of mind in case, you know, the, the stores start running out of food? Have a veritable bunker full of food yourself to cover yourself just in case. I feel real secure with my, believe it or not, year and a quarter, because I did the math wrong, um, worth of food in my basement. And it's just taken up one little quarter. And just one little area. I actually sold what was there because I didn't really need it and made a profit on it. So, I mean, you want to get self-sufficient, you want to get informed, check out the rest of the videos on this channel. I know, very self-serving, but like I said, go check out other bigger, better channels than mine. And watch out for the sensationalist morons who just complain about the government and say the world's going to collapse tomorrow. Or people with horribly sensational clickbait bullshit thumbnails and titles. Like, for example, okay, fine, we all know who I'm talking about, I don't even need to say it. I did already at least go to his comment section and insult him to his face and called him out. He does have a cult of fanboys that uh, kind of had some backlash, but other people were like, yeah, you know, you're making a point there. And the rest of us more based prepper channels, we really resent that guy. We really think his channel shouldn't be as big as it is. And the ironic thing is his information is actually really good and well put together and well researched some of the time. When he started talking about topics that I know a lot about, I'm like, wow, he made like 10 drastic errors in there. So you kind of wonder the stuff that I don't know so much about, how accurate that is too. Just saying, which is why I only make videos on stuff that I know about. So uh, definitely subscribe for the best information, the most extensive, like, useful information instead of some 10-minute, you know, listicle top 10 bullshit that doesn't actually tell you anything. Can you tell I got a bit of a chip on my shoulder about other channels? The ones that don't help and just piss people off and are there for borderline entertainment and just rage bait garbage? Yeah, don't watch those. Watch actual educational sources. Not even prepper channels, just like stuff where they just teach you stuff. Hell, go subscribe to Cook's Kitchen. That, that's a great channel. So I think that's enough advice for one video. If you like this super extensive look at everything, the psychology, the practical steps, everything top to bottom, which is how I like to cover stuff in more of a long podcast form, so that you can you know watch it while you're at the gym or driving or whatever you're doing, cleaning your house, doing gardening, Mowing the lawn, that's why I always watch podcasts. Well then leave a like and watch some more. Thanks for watching everybody and I'll see you guys next time.